put his thumb up. Yeah. He's in here. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyiat amalina من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله محمد بن عبد الله صلوات الله والسلام عليه وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. As it has been announced, going to do two sessions إن شاء الله up into صلاة العشاء concerning some of the things that we should be reminded of. Of what the people of knowledge have given us based upon proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah in regards to the mobile phone as well as social media. The usage of the mobile phone itself as well as some issues dealing with social media. And a lot can be said about this particular issue, both of them. Similar to the presentation that we gave concerning the fiqh of the masajid, the things that the Muslim should know, Muslim man or the Muslim woman, in regards to how to come into the masjid, what to do in the masjid, what not to do in the masjid, how to leave the masjid, and so forth and so on. We have mentioned that that particular dars was a dars that could have been longer than what we made it, and it's one of those primary fundamental issues that we should make ourselves aware of in terms of getting comprehension. Not just hearing a class here or there, but really getting fiqh about the issue. Comprehension. Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan, Radwanullahi alayhima, in an authentic hadith, and that hadith is mutawatir, many of the companions narrated the hadith, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man yuridillahu bihi khayra yufaqihu fi deen. If Allah wants good for a person, He'll give him comprehension and understanding of the religion. Where he's in a position where he is able to worship Allah and he knows why he's doing what he's doing and so forth and so on. And this is one of those issues. What did the religion of Islam say about how to use the mobile phone and how to use and deal with the different aspects of social media. No one sitting here should be shocked at the fact that although the Prophet Wasallam during his time, he didn't have a mobile phone, obviously, and there was no social media at that time. And yet we can extract from the Quran ayat and we can take a hadith directly from the authentic sunnah of the Nabi al-Mustafa al-Mukhtar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And we can apply them to how to use the mobile phone And how to use social media Although the Prophet never saw a mobile phone Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And that is something that is accepted by every Muslim And that's because Al-Islam is a religion For all times For all places For all circumstances And Allah described himself in the Quran وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّةً your Lord was not forgetful. When he legislated the things that were legislated over 1,400 years ago, he knew the condition and the details that the people were going to be confronted with right now. So we can take many ayat and many ahadith directly from the Quran that teach us how to use a mobile phone. And if there's not a direct ayat or a direct hadith, we can make qiyas or analogy. We can also look at the maqasid of the religion, the goals and the objectives of Al-Islam. And when we study about the goals and the objectives as we did before, we know one of the main goals and objectives of Al-Islam 
is to make life easy for Benny Adam, all of them. Allah Ta'ala didn't create us to make things difficult upon us. He created us to worship him and to worship him in a way that is easy and to exist in a way that is easy without undue, unnecessary mashaqqa and difficulty. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكَ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجِ مِنْ لَتَابِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ He has not made on you and your religion any difficulty. This is the religion of your father, Ibrahim, salawatu Allahi wa salamu So in regards to the issue of the jawal, the mobile phone, and social media, the first thing I want to bring to your attention is that this is one of the mu'jizat of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam as some of the ulama of Islam have put forward and they claimed. The fact that we have social media and we have the mobile phone, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned indirectly some isharat, some things that will show he knew sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in the future from his time that the world was going to change and we would have this thing that we're dealing with right now. Like in the authentic hadith that's been collected by Imam Ahmed in his Musnad and other than him on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ridwanullahi alayhi. He was with some of his students like Tariq ibn Shihab who was narrated in the incident and they all went to the masjid in order to pray the salat in jama'ah. But when they arrived in the masjid, the people were already praying. And they found the people behind the imam, and they were in ruku'ah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud started walking towards the saf, and he said, Allahu Akbar, and he bent down and put his hands on his knees, his palms on his knees, and he walked in the ruku'ah position. He walked all the way until he got to the line, to the saf. And the people who were with him, they did the same thing in following him. They arrived at the saf, and the people stood up, he stood up, everyone stood up, and then they made sajda and so forth and so on. And he completed the salat. After the salat, they wanted to find out why they did what they did. But there was another man who said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Ya Aba Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman or Abdullah bin Mas'ul was with other people, with his students. This man said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, just to Abdur Abdullah bin Mas'ul. And he didn't say it to the other people. He said, His kunya, Ya Aba Abdurrahman. Abdullah bin Mas'ul relayed the salams back and he said, Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they all left. The students started saying amongst themselves, why did he say the Prophet told the truth? We need to ask him. Who's going to ask him? So one of them said to him, Why when that man said to you, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Ya Aba, Aba, Aba Abdurrahman, you said, Sadaqa Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that I heard the Prophet say, Salawatullahi wa sallamu alayhi, Inna bayna yaday as saati taslim al khasa wa fashuwu tijara. حتى تئين المرأة زوجها على التجارة وقطع الأرحام وشهادة الزور وكتمان شهادة الحق وظهور القلم. He said, I heard the Prophet say, صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, he told us, verily, right before the hours established, بين يد الساعة, right before يوم القيامة is established, the salams are going to be based upon people knowing that person. If he doesn't know you on a first name basis and he doesn't deal with you, he won't give you salams. He'll only give you salams if he knows you. And this is what has happened in our ummah. And that people won't give salams to people that they don't know. He said that's number one. Also, tijara or commerce, buying and selling is going to spread and it's going to be widespread to the point that a woman will be in business to the point where she'll be helping her own husband to, to, to do a tijara. That's another thing that has happened now. Not that it's haram, but during the time of the Prophet 
the women, the way the society was, the way the life was, they practiced that ayah of the Quran where Allah commanded the women, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرَّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى You women, you Muslim women, you should stay in your homes to the best of your ability. Stay in your homes. And don't come out and make the display like the times of al jahiliya. So if you have to come out, then come out in full hijab. Don't be a person that has perfume on. Walk down the side of the road that the Prophet told you. Don't mix with people and so forth and so on. So now he said, that's going to change. That before Yom Al-Qiyamah, there's going to be a lot, a lot of, a lot of tijara to the point where the lady, the wife, is going to help the husband at his job or in his job. He also mentions, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in this hadith, from the signs of the hours that people would disconnect their ties of relationship, and that people would bear false witness, and people will hide and conceal their true witness. People will make false witness to shahada that's not true. And the shahada that's true, he won't say it. He won't say, yes, that's right, that's true. He won't have it. And then the last one, and this is the point. And from the signs of the hour is there will be spread of the pen. The hur al-qalam. That the pen or writing is going to be prevalent. This last part of this hadith, the scholars of Islam the present contemporary scholars so it's a proof and it's a delil that general knowledge of the dunya is going to spread as for the other hadith of the prophet وسلم, from the signs of the hour is that knowledge is going to be taken away one hadith said knowledge is going to be taken away and this hadith says knowledge is going to spread there's no conflict and there's no contradiction the Muslim just has to take his time, ask someone who knows, and he can harmonize the two form. What does it mean? From the signs of the hour, knowledge will be taken away. What does that mean? Knowledge of the deen will be taken away. You give a person an opportunity to perform umr al-hajj, he doesn't know what he's doing. You ask a person, come, read the Quran for me. He doesn't know what he's doing. You ask a person different aspects of his religion that are basic, he doesn't know, he doesn't comprehend them. That's the knowledge that's going to be taken away. As for the knowledge that's going to be widespread, it's the knowledge of the dunya, the knowledge of technology, the knowledge and the spread of all kinds of books and all kinds of information. And the internet is exactly that. The internet is exactly that. Those of you who have the book by a Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Silsilat Al-Ahadith, Al-Sahiha, the series of a hadith that are authentic. If you go to hadith number 2767, he talks about this aspect of the hadith and what it proves. That is from the proof of his nabuwa. The fact that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he may not have known exactly what the internet is, he may not know, know he may not have known exactly. What is the smartphone, the mobile phone? He may not have known that exactly, but he gave some isharat, some indications that this is going to be the condition that people are going to be living in towards the end of time. And that's how it is. That's how it is. The reality it is, that's how it is. As it relates, Ikhwani, to the ruling of the mobile phone and the ruling of the social media, we say that the rulings of these issues are according to what they're used for. If they're used for what is beneficial, then they are halal. They are mustahab and recommended. And they're beneficial. Person get a reward. But if it's being used in the wrong way, then in that case, it's going to take the hukum of, the ruling of, what is being used for. What is it being used for? So what I did is, there's a book by a sheikh, Kunya is Abu Ibrahim, and his name is Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Muqbal. He is from El Yemen, and he's from the students of the sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab al Wasabi, tremendous scholar of the Sunnah. He wrote a book, and he called his book 24 Principles That the Muslim Needs to Know as It Relates to the Etiquette of the Telephone. 24 things, 24 dawabit. 24 rules and regulation 
that the Muslim should be aware of as it relates to using the mobile phone. Now, some of them, people already know. People already know. But based upon the Quran and the Sunnah, and based upon what the ulama of the past were upon and the ulama of today, he mentions some of those things, so I gathered a few of them, not all 24, and we're going to deal with a few of them in the first session. And then in the second session, inshallah, azawajal, we're going to deal with the social media aspect of our presentation. By Allah Ta'ala's tawfiq. When we talk about etiquette, ikhwari, al-adab, and al-adab, it's a really important issue in al-Islam. Scholars of islam used to write books about the importance of al-adab and al-adab. Al-Imam al-Bukhari, he wrote a number of books. One of the books that he has, that is a book by itself. That book is called Al-Adab al-Mufrad. That book was written so that the young man can grow up knowing how to sit, how to behave, how to deal with people. So that the young Muslim girl will grow up and she knows the importance of when to speak, how to speak, how to deal with the elders, issues of cleanliness, al-adab and mufrat And why did he put that book together? Well, I just told you, nasiha for the ummah, so that people can learn how to do things, how to sit in a masjid, how to sit in the presence of people older than you, and all of those issues. Also in his book, Sahil Bukhari, his book of hadith, Sahil Bukhari, is a chapter in that book called Kitab Al-Adab or Al-Adab, the book of etiquette. So he wrote a book by itself about etiquette. And in his Sahih Bukhari, he brought the most authentic ahadith and he put it in that particular chapter. Another scholar of Islam was from the students of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He is well known as being Ibn Muflih. He wrote a book and his book is called Al-Adab al sharia it's a really deep book, a thick book about adab and why we do this and why we do that. Everything you need to know about your cleanliness, what to do on Friday and all of that, all of that. Point is, scholars of Islam, they wrote these books, these three books and other than them. Why? Because adab is important in the religion of Islam. It's important that the Muslim child, youngster, man, woman is aware of the importance of having etiquette, how to behave with people and around people and so forth and so on. So this adab in al-Islam, we can superimpose what came from the Quran and the Sunnah right upon the issue of how to use the telephone, how to use the mobile phone or any telephone for that matter. There are some adab that come to us in the Quran and the Sunnah and these are the things we're going to share with you inshallah. And again, we're using the book that the Sheikh wrote, 24 Dawabit, that Muslim needs to know, rules and regulation, as it relates to the everyday usage of this, because if a person were to do it, this mundane thing that has nothing to do with his religion, the paper has nothing to do with his religion by itself, but if used the correct way, he can get rewarded for it being in his presence. If used the wrong way, it could be something that can land him into the hellfire. Not just in the hellfire, but in the lowest parts of the hellfire, getting the worst punishment that has been prepared for the criminals in the hellfire. But how is he going to know? There are some things that we just know because they're well known. Shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. But there are some things that are very easy, that are from etiquettes and edip, that if we come to know about those things, inshallah, and we started to inculcate them and practice them, Inshallah, Azawajal, there is a number of rewards. First thing that the Sheikh mentioned in his book, and many people take this as something that's like really insignificant sometimes, but it is important because the Prophet put a lot of emphasis on it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that he mentioned that when Muslims call each other, it's similar to Muslims meeting each other. So in Arabic, this is called a connecting device, something that connects people to one another. So when Muslims connect to one another, there are things we should do that the Prophet ﷺ advised strongly. And he even said, if people don't do this, then don't answer them and don't pay attention to them. 
And at the top of the list is the issue of giving the salams. So if someone were to go to someone else's house, he knocks on the door, he should give the salam. As the man came to the Prophet's door, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, who is it? On the other side, the man said, me, ana, it's me. The Prophet said to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ana, ana, who, me, me? What do you mean it's me? How do I know, what do you mean by it's me on the other side of the door? You have to announce yourself and make yourself known. So he told one of the younger companions, go and teach that man. The boy was young. Go and teach that man the etiquette of al istidhan and it's that that is when you seek permission to come into someone's house. And in Sal Bukhari, there is a chapter, Al Istidhan. How and when do we go in on people? How do we go on them? When do we go on them? When do we not go in on them? In Surah Al Nur, there have been ayat revealed. I'm a father, I'm a husband. There are ayat that tell my children when to come to me and how to come to me. I had that tell me, I have daughters in my house. I can't just walk into their rooms like that. The chapter of Al-Istidhan. Many of those ahadith, many of those adab, those etiquettes are connected to that form. So the first thing he mentioned was the issue of As-Salam. As-Salam. That when we call people, the very first thing that Muslims should do is not say hello to people because it's not the way of greeting in Al-Islam. He said... The Muslim has six rights over his brother. The very first right that he mentioned was If you were to meet your Muslim brother, you have to give him salams. He said, if anyone starts to talk to you without giving you salams, he said, don't talk to him. Don't talk to you. But this hadith doesn't make it haram if someone starts talking to you and he doesn't give you salam. Makes doesn't make it haram that you can't talk to him. But if you are the father, if you're the husband, if you're a person in a position of teaching people, then in teaching them the importance of the salam, this is something you should do. But if your Muslim boss came and started talking to you and he didn't give you salams and he said to you, hey, why didn't you bring that over? And you just look at him like that. And then he fires you as a result of that. You didn't understand that hadith correctly. And don't say, you're firing me for something the Prophet told me not to do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these hadith, they have to have some level of comprehension to them. If someone speaks to you, many hadith. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jibril would come to him. Jibril wouldn't give him salams. He would just start talking to him. Rasulullah would come out to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he didn't say salams. He would just start talking to him. So this hadith, we understand it to mean... If you're in a position where you're a supervisor, you're an elder, you're teaching, people are looking up to you and learning from you and respecting you, then these are the people who you do this with. Your child comes in in the morning and he says, Ma, Ummi, I'm hungry. Don't say anything back to him until he realizes the importance of practicing this and then when it's inside of him, inshallah, it's something that you won't have to worry about anymore. So anyway, the sheikh said, in this first issue, when you call someone in Al-Islam using that telephone, who is the one who should begin the salams? Is it the one who, when he gets the call and he sees that your name comes up on his phone and he answers the telephone and he sees your name, he says, the one who is being called, hey, Ahmed, salamu alaikum. He said, no. The sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is that the one who's knocking and the one who is initiating, he is the individual that starts off the salams because he's the one who's knocking at the door. When he calls, he's the one who is connecting to you. So the ayat of the Quran told us, Ya ayyulladina amanu, la tadkhulu bayutan ghayra bayutikum hatta tasta'nisu wa tusallimu ala ahliha. Oh, you believe. When you go to people's houses and you connect with those people, do not enter into the houses until, until you give salams to the people and you let them know of your presence. So the one who is actually doing the calling, the best thing is for him to initiate the salams for that individual. So if you pick up the phone as a student of knowledge, for an example, and you answer the call and you say to him, Naam, yes, and you wait for him to give you the salams and then you return the salams 
and the ahkam of the salam of well-known. We're not going to go through all of that. He mentioned that issue. To remind the Muslims that this is an issue that's connected to our religion. Don't just leave it as something that's nothing. It can be used in your favor. And the way it's being used by most people, it's a problem. This mobile phone is a fitna now. It used to be where all we had was the computer and the internet. That became a fitna when you were at home. But you had to be at home. Now everything is at your fingertip. The internet is here. Everything. After the salat, after the salat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In the jama'ah. Very first thing that some people do without making dhikr or anything else. Pull out the phone to see what kind of messages you have or just to look at it. You may not even have a message because it is a fitna. And the way it's being used, for the most part, it's not correct. It's incorrect. So take advantage of these small issues, inshallah, azawajal, and we will repel and push away that fitna or at least bring up the good deeds in the good scales. Number two, Ikhwani, the issue that the Sheikh brought is the importance of your time as it relates to these phones. And when he talked about the time, he talked about a number of things. One of the things he talked about was when you call people. In Al Islam, we were talking about Adab and Adab, the married lady, the lady who has a husband. She has friends that she talks to throughout the course of the day. When her husband comes home, it's not acceptable for that lady to be on the phone doing that valuable time that she should be spending with her husband and her children, but especially her husband. And the women amongst themselves should understand that. And I think in many of our cultures, most of our women, they know that. In our culture, Islamic culture, most of our women know that. When my husband comes, don't call me. Or if a girl calls... And she hears the husband in the background say, I'll call you back tomorrow. Some people have that understanding. And that's from the etiquettes of Al-Islam. It's not from the etiquettes of Al-Islam for the sister to find herself on the telephone talking like that, unless that is obviously okay with her husband. It's okay. That's a critical time where we shouldn't bother people. People have the haq to be with their family. Similar to that are the men who call other men. You have to call the man and you call him at a time when he's spending time with his wife, spending time with his children, or late at night. When he talked about time, he talked about the issue of the lateness. As I told you, in Surat and nur there are those ayat that are telling us how to enter in upon the mother and the father, the husband and the wife. In al Islam in the past, people who had younger children, they also had slaves. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned these long ayats in Surah An-Nur telling the Muslims, teach your children when to come in. You have to seek permission to come into the house of the mother and the father, come into the room, the bedroom of the mother and father at Fajr time. You have to seek permission, the Quran said, to come into the room of your mother and your father at Dhuhr time, at Dhahira, or the time of siesta. Something we don't really have in this society. But right now, back in the Arab world, it's still there a little bit. But during the time of the Prophet wasallam, it was an essential part of their day. The Qaylula. He commanded the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, take the midday siesta. Qaylu, fa inna shaytana la yaqul. Take the Qaylula, because the shaytan, he doesn't have a Qaylula. And the Qaylula, they used to do it. The man would go to sleep at midday after Salat al-Dhuhr so that he'll be rejuvenated for the next part of the day and he'll be able to do what he has to do and also get up in the middle of the night. But if he stayed up all day into the nighttime, he's going to sleep from nighttime to Fajr time because the body has rights on you. Their lives were part of this issue of Qaylula. So Allah told the youngsters, don't come into your parents' room at that time without knocking on the door. And the third time is after Salat al-Isha. And Allah said in that ayat, when you take your clothes off. These, he said in the ayat, thalathu awratun lakum. They are the three times of your awra. And the awra is the nakedness that shouldn't be seen by other people. Only the husband can see the awra of the wife. The wife can see the awra of the husband. But we shouldn't expose our awra to our children who are 
of age and they know what the outer is all about. Something that is not from the etiquette of Al-Islam. It's not from the adab of Al-Islam. So the Sheikh anyway, when he was talking about the issue of a time, he said in calling people, you shouldn't call people when it's too early, shouldn't call people when it's too late, shouldn't call people at those times in which you know you're making is aj. The last thing that he mentioned about the time is that the time is a ni'mah. It's one of the biggest ni'mahs that Allah has given us. Ni'matan maghbunu fihima kathiru min nas There are two ni'mahs that Allah gave everybody. Many people are negligent as it relates to them. And he said that they were good health and al farah Good health and al farah as sihatu wal farah A ni'mah is to be in good health because you can appreciate life better. You live a fuller life when you have good health. The second one is when you are free. To be free to do things. Because a person who's perpetually busy, his life is a problem. So since free time is a ni'mah, don't waste it. Don't waste it by killing time, talking on the phone for a long time. I don't want to be stereotypical. And I don't want to say that Women are the people who talk on the phone, but the reality is women are the people who talk on the phone. Women talk on the phone for long durations of time. Sometimes it's beneficial, many times it's not. Just kalam fari. As for the man being an individual, I mean, who does that? Who calls another man and he's on the telephone 45 minutes to an hour on a daily basis with his ashab? Who does that? We understand that sometimes because the woman is in her home, she's not going out, she has to be connected to people. So in making an attempt to connect to people, she's on the phone for long periods of time with one individual. But even with that, she has to be aware of the issue of wasting time, wasting time. Spending too much time on the telephone will come as a cause of sorrow for us, Yomu Qiyama. Allah's Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that four things la yazulu la tazulu qadama al abdi yawm al qiyamah hatta yusal an arba. The two feet of the slave is not going to be moved. It's not going to move when he's standing before Allah until he's asked about four things. And two of those things are related to his time. It's going to be asked about his life. How did he spend it? His time. It's going to be asked about his youth. How did he spend it? If the answer is, I wasted a lot of valuable time not doing things that were in obedience to Allah, this is going to be a problem. So you mentioned that, and I think that's something that we should be aware of. Number three, and there were 24 issues. We're only going to mention a few, inshallah. And this one is important as well, because we suffer from this. And he talked about the role that the telephone plays in wasting our money. And wasting our money. When a person is going to get a phone, he has to shop for a phone like he shops for everything else. He wants to purchase books, he has to have a minhaj in purchasing books. Wants to purchase clothes, shoes, a car, it has to be a minhaj. No one goes to the marketplace, ashwa'i, and he's like spinning around, like twirling around. He's walking from shop to shop, twirling around like this, not paying attention. And he just finds himself in this shop and he just starts. People who do that, they waste a lot of money. And again, the issue of the women. Some women can go to the bull ring and they only have five pounds in their pocket and they'll spend seven hours in the bull ring where the man he can have 100 pounds, two, 300 pounds in his pocket and he only wants to be in the bull ring for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, in and he's out. If you don't have a minhaj in the way, a methodology in the way that you shop and you do things, you'll wind up wasting a lot of time and just as important, wasting a lot of money. So the person who wants to purchase a phone, he has to know what he wants, why does he want it. And when he wants to get the type of minutes that are best suited for his needs, he has to look at that issue. Maybe it'll be in his best interest, and we don't shop like this. Maybe it's in his best interest to get, since everybody in the family has a phone, four or five phones amongst us, who from amongst our community actually goes to the phone shop and he says, we want to get a package where we'll get four or five phones and the package in terms of the time, the minutes, what they're giving us and the way of internet, all of that is going to reduce the price because we did it as a family. Intelligent people, they shop like that. Unintelligent, unsophisticated people shop in the other way. We waste unnecessary money. 
We have to get three different phones. When we get the phone, when we get the phone, we call overseas. And in calling overseas, you waste your time, you waste your minutes, you waste your money. So these are the issues that the Sheikh brought to the attention of the people, especially with us, a lot of us have relatives who come from countries where the economics of the country are adverse. Very difficult living in some of the countries where we come from. And we have relatives that we're responsible for helping. Or we should be helping them. And helping them, in helping them, to try to save money and prevent ourselves from wasting. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانِ الشَّيَاطِينَ O Muslims, don't be of those people who waste, for verily the wasters are from the brothers of the shayateen, of the shaytan. He brought another issue. The connection of the phone and the issue of music. He said that when it comes to the ringtone on the telephone, the Muslim should choose a ringtone that is the closest one to the Quran and the Sunnah that he possibly can choose. What's the meaning of choosing a ringtone that's the closest one to the Quran and the Sunnah? The one that's far away from what Allah or his messenger وسلم, may haram. The Nabi وسلم, he made music haram. The Prophet وسلم, he made music haram. He said that they were going to come at people at the end of time. They would try to make music, musical instruments halal. So we understand from that that is haram. Allah Ta'ala mentioned hadith from the people of those people who purchase vain speech. The companion Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, Lahul hadith in this hadith, wallahi in this ayat, it means al aghani it's the singing. Those people who buy slave girls who used to sing, entertainers, those people who make musical instruments in order to entertain themselves and entertain other people. The issue of music is haram. And I would advise you, there's probably one of the best books in English is called The Ruling of Music in Islam. It's an e-book. It's for free. You don't have to pay any money. You can download it. It's one of those beneficial books that bring all of the proofs that show the impermissibility of music and it refutes the side of the people who say that it is not haram. Ala kullin, the point here. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his time, he told his companions, one of the practices that they had was they would put bells around their animals, a bell around the neck of the cow, around the neck of the camel, around the neck of the sheep, and so forth and so on. When they used to travel, the camel will have a, neck, a, a bell around its neck. The Nabi would tell the people, anybody who has a bell on his camel, take it off. For verily, the Malaika, they do not accompany a caravan where these bells are ringing. He said that these bells, they attract the attention of the shayateen. So, the doorbell in Islam wouldn't be like the doorbell that we have in the West if we were doing it the proper way. And that's what happens when we totally, absolutely assimilate. We're all about assimilating, where we have the ability to assimilate. But when assimilation dictates that we're going to disobey Allah or his messenger in this religion, we're going to tell everybody, no, we're not going to do that. It's similar to our parents. We're going to obey our parents and what they tell us to do. And we're going to obey. The wife's going to obey her husband because that's his heart. We're going to obey the law and the system. But anyone in creation who is telling us, disobey Allah, don't pray, don't do this, don't do that, we're going to say we're not going to do that if we have the ability. So total, absolute assimilation is against our religion. We can't totally, absolute assimilate until we get to the point where we melt into everybody else and our identity is lost. No, we have a religious responsibility to hold on to those things that make us who we are and what we are. So, as it relates to this issue of the phone, if he had the ability to get a phone and the tone on the phone, he shouldn't make the tone music that goes off. He shouldn't do that. He shouldn't have the tone of the phone. It's a tone of a sound that is problematic. 
He has to try to find what is best. Now we come to the issue of what some people do, and that is some people use as their phone tone the Quran, the recitation of the Quran. Or they use a dua. The imam is in the haram and he's making a dua. Use those types of things. The ulama of al-Islam and the shaykh brought this fatwa from the legendary tadaim of the major scholars there in Saudi Arabia. At the head of the list, the mufti there, Sheikh Abdul Aziz al-Sheikh, al-Ghudayan, al-Luhaydan. They asked him, is it, shukran, is it permissible for the Muslim to use the Quran and the recitation of the Quran as his ringtone? They said it's not permissible because Allah didn't reveal the Quran for that. And also it may go off at a place in the time where it's disrespectful to the Quran. Like if he's in the hammam for an example, if a person has ayat that are written on a piece of paper, in order to get rid of that paper, there's a way you get rid of the paper. You just don't throw it in the street, on the ground, in the rubbish, in the bed, not like that. You have to discard it in the best way possible. So as it relates to the kalam of Allah, the kalam of Allah should be expected, it should be exalted, and it shouldn't be taken for things like that. Similar to what the scholar said, when you build a masjid and you want to write the calligraphy of the ayat of the masjid on the wall, the Quran wasn't revealed to be like that, to be art and so forth and so on. Allah gave us all of the reasons why he revealed the Quran, and the Prophet ﷺ gave us all of the reasons as to why the Quran was revealed. And in none of that did it say it was revealed for these types of things. So they all said that it should be avoided altogether. We're going to stop here, inshallah, because Salat is uh, the Adhan is uh, in 10 minutes. Give you an opportunity to make preparation for the Adhan, and then we'll complete the second half. The last things we have to say about the telephone, and then we'll go into the issue of the social media. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. The Q&A session, inshallah, khwani, will be after the next session, for both sessions.